Okay, so our lesson is an introduction to statistics. So we'll start with the overview of statistics, starting with uh, data. So when we say data, that is the building blocks of statistics, and it consists of information coming from uh, observations, counts, measurements, or responses from surveys. So since this is the building blocks of statistics, so statistics then is the uh, science of collecting, organizing all of this data, interpreting all of this to make informed decisions. So for example, a school has to decide whether to hire a new faculty for the incoming school year based on the enrollment statistics or the data on enrollment. Okay, so we will also encounter the word population, so that is the collection of all outcomes, responses, measurements, or counts that are of uh, interest to the researcher. And when we say sample being subset of a population, but then when we say sample, it must represent the population, meaning to say all the characteristics of the population is in that uh, sample. So what you observe in the population must be observed in the uh, sample. Okay, so let us have example of samples and populations. Okay, so in a recent survey of college students in a university, 250 were selected to participate and they were asked to answer whether uh, they smoked cigarettes regularly and of the 250, 35 of them said yes. So, the population here is the university students. So, all of the students in the university, while the uh, sample is consist of that 250 who participated in the survey. And the 35 who said yes is what you call a sample statistic. So, a term parameter is the characteristic of the population. So, observable characteristic of the population is called a parameter. And the observable characteristic of this sample is called the statistics. So if we have the mnemonic, parameter is to population and the piece, and statistic is to a sample, then the same thing. You have to take note of the S. So let us have this example. We will decide whether the numerical value given uh, describes a population parameter or a sample statistic. So, for example, a recent survey of 450 college students reported that their average weekly income is 1,200 pesos. So, since 1,200 uh, pesos is from the sample of 450 college students, then that makes 1,200 a sample statistic. While in the second one, the average weekly income of all students is 1,200. So since it's of all students, 1,200 is from all of the students. So that's coming from a population. Therefore, 1,200 pesos is a uh, population parameter. Statistics has two branches. Okay, so descriptive statistics and inferential statistics. So descriptive statistics involves the organization, summary, and display of data so it is simply summarizing although it involves numbers but then the numbers there are just to summarize the raw data so that it could be understood also by the consumer while when you say uh inferential statistics that involves using a sample to oops to draw conclusions about a population so you will observe a few then based on what you observe from the few, you will decide or you will draw conclusions or generalize it to the uh, population. Okay, so for example, in a recent study, volunteers who had less than six hours of sleep were four times more likely to answer incorrectly on a science test than were participants who had at least eight hours of sleep. And you decide which part is the descriptive stats and what conclusion might be drawn using uh, inferential statistics. So the four times more likely to answer incorrectly is the descriptive part, while the inferential part there is... Uh, those who are sleeping less than six hours were four were more likely to answer incorrectly than those who 
sleep at least 8 hours. So that is the inference there. So in statistics, we'll be collecting data. So we'll uh, collect ki different kinds of data. So data are classified as quality or quantity. So when we say quality, that consists of attributes, labels, or the, these are the non-numerical entries like the gender, like the religion, marital status, highest educational attainment, that is qualitative data. While for quantitative data, that is uh, consisting of measurements or counts, so it is numerical. So if we're going to illustrate quality and quantity in this example, the names of the students are, is the quality data and the GPA is the quantity data. So quantitative data can be discrete or continuous. So when we say discrete, it is a product of is a product of or I mean it's a result of counts. So how many? So it is a whole number. It does not take a decimal value. It answers the question uh, how many? So it's whole number. While for continuous, it's a result of measurement, so it's how much it can take a decimal value. For example, you have the hospital bed capacity. It is discrete because, I mean, it's you are counting the hospital beds. And COVID-19 fatalities is also discrete because you are counting how many died because of COVID-19. 12 kilograms is continuous because you are, uh, it's a product of measurement, although it's a whole number there, it does not take a decimal point, but it's, since it is a result of measurement, that's continuous, like the 200 milligram per deciliter, that's continuous, and two teaspoons also is continuous. Then data that we have collected is also uh, classified in terms of levels of measurement because statistical calculations will be meaningful if uh, that is based on the levels of measurements of your data. So you have the levels of measurement as nominal, ordinal, interval, and ratio. That is nominal is the lowest to the highest, which is the ratio. So when we say nominal, that is... Uh, Names, so naming is nominal, less namings, labels, or qualities. So there is no mathematical computation that can be made at this level. But you can summarize them in terms of frequencies. Like the colors in the Philippine flag that is nominal. The names of students in your class is nominal. Textbooks you are using this semester is nominal gender is nominal but then you can you can summarize them in terms of numbers how many are males and how many are females then we have the ordinal so ordinal is arranged in order it still has the characteristic of the nominal but it is arranged in order okay so but the differences between data is not meaningful at all like for example the class standings freshman sophomore junior senior you cannot subtract senior minus freshman equals sophomore like that you cannot subtract but it is arranged in order so there is still characteristic of the nominal here numbers in the back of each player shirt is considered nominal at some point while others also uh classify that as nominal it's not wrong when you say it's ordinal or nominal because in the ordinal number it still has the characteristic of the nominal only that there is some uh, order or some ranking like the top 50 songs played on radio then interval so interval is there is no inherent zero so there is no absolute zero in the interval Okay, so it simply represents position in a scale. For example, the temperature. Okay, so when you say zero degrees centigrade, that, that is not an absence of zero. But it's, it means to us that it is at the freezing point. Okay, so it's the borderline. Okay, so that is what we mean by no inherent uh, zero. But then you can subtract uh, there you can subtract the differences. So for example, yesterday was uh, 32 degrees centigrade. The 
the temperature and today that is 28 degrees centigrade so you can subtract 32 minus 28 like that but you cannot say that uh if we're going to subtract uh, if we're going to compare 50 and 100 then you would say 100 is twice as hot as 50 it is wrong so you cannot have uh, you can subtract, but you cannot have a meaningful ratio in uh, if it is in the interval level of measurement. The years and the timeline is also an example. Then when you say ratio, this time you have the absolute zero. Zero is meaningful and you can have a meaningful ratio also. So for example, ages, you are, let's say, 20, I am 40, so I am twice as old as you are. And there is a zero age, meaning to say the baby is still unborn. That's a zero age or the weight zero. So you are not weighing something because if, if it, that's the zero is the weight or you would say that uh, I weigh 60 kilograms and you weigh uh, let's say 30 kilograms so you i am twice as heavy as you are so that's how we do it in the ratio so you can subtract and you can find a meaningful ratio and there is an absolute zero so if we're going to summarize it in the table okay so in the nominal level you can put data in categories yes but you cannot arrange them in order you cannot subtract their values nor you can determine a multiple of it ordinal yes you can put them in categories you can arrange in order but you cannot subtract you cannot find a meaningful ratio interval you can put them in categories you can arrange them in order you can subtract but there is no uh, meaningful ratio while for the ratio you can put them in categories you can arrange them in order you can subtract data values and you can find a meaningful ratio that is why when you are going to do research it is advisable that you collect data which are in the ratio level because statistical treatment also is different for data which are in the ratio level than those in the lower levels of measurement now let's move on to descriptive statistics so when we say statistics okay so studies generate large numbers of data points and researchers use statistics to summarize the data so that it is going to provide a better understanding of the overall tendencies within the distribution of scores. Okay, so we have statistics because it's important in uh, summarizing uh, results it aids in summarizing results it also helps us recognize underlying trends and tendencies in the data and most especially it aids us in communicating the results to the others to the consumers of our uh, study so if we wanted to characterize the students in this class we would find that they are young uh, from Kentucky if they're from the US or they are fit and they are male. So how young, how Kentuckian, how fit, what is the distribution of males and females. So there are methods of summarizing data either it's textual, tabular, and numerical. So it is textual when it is less than five data points and it is tabular or graphical when it has more than five data points and for big data we'll be using numerical summary okay so there is no need for me to explain on the textual but on the uh, tabular so 
Okay, so the distribution is really differently depending upon the measurement level. So for nominal scales, they are read as discrete measurement at each level. For ordinal, you show tendencies. Okay, but categories should not be compared while well, for interval and ratio scales that allows us for comparison among categories. So when your data is nominal, you will simply count them and make a percentage distribution. While for ordinal, you can show tendencies. You can have the mean, I don't know, not the mean, but the median. But for interval and ratio scales, you will now be allowed to do comparisons. If there's a difference between the uh, scores of students in the first section and in the uh, second section when there is a test on math, for example. Then frequency distribution can sometimes be a uh, simple frequency distribution. Okay, so so easy. You just have the percent frequency and the percentage frequency. For example, you have that distribution of students in the College of Education by areas of specialization. Okay, so you are simply counting how many are math majors, English majors, social science majors, biology majors, physical education, Filipino. So that is simply counting and converting them into percentage or into proportion. There is regular or ungrouped frequency distribution almost similar to the simple frequency distribution. Okay, so if you have that. Uh, you have the number of children per family of 25 randomly selected uh, families in a barangay. So, uh, for the number of children, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7 or more. So, how many families have 7 or more children, 6 children, 5 children, and so on. And you can see it in the frequency. You can also add here the uh, percentage. So, to give you the idea that a majority of the families have four and two children. Because if you notice, uh, there are five families has four children, which has four children and two children. Then we have the group frequency distribution. So, the group frequency distribution is used when you have so many values of the variable being analyzed. So, you are going to group them by range. Why class interval or by simple classes and you have the class limits. Okay, so when you're going to group them into uh, a group frequency distribution, you will be encountering terms like class intervals. So when you say class intervals, they are non-overlapping or mutually exclusive categories. Like if you are going to uh, put them on an interval like the age, 10 to 14, or 10 to 19, 20 to 29, 30 to 39, like that by decade. So that is, those are class intervals. And class intervals should have the same width. Uniform uh, width. So if you started with the width of 10, like 10 to 19, because if you count from the number 10 to 19, you would notice that it is 10, that would be the same uh, width until the last class interval. Then the class limit, okay, so that specifies the magnitude of your uh, values. So in the interval that I have given you 10 to 19, 10 is the lower limit while 19 is the upper limit. Then there is the term class midpoint. So when you say class midpoint, that is the average of the lower limit and the upper limit. So you will simply add the lower plus the upper limit, then divide by 2, you get the class midpoint. The same way with the math. Okay, so the midpoint is the average of x1, x1 plus x2 over 2 and y1 plus y2 over 2. That's how you do it. So the same thing, midpoint. You will simply add the endpoints, then divide by 2. So in this case, there's the lower limit plus the upper limit or the endpoints and divide by 2. 
Then we have this class frequency, so that is uh, called class frequency or simply frequency. So you are counting how many belong to that, uh, how many observations belong to that class. And then there is relative frequency, so that's over the total. Cumulative frequency is you are adding the frequencies from the lowest to the highest. You continuously adding, so that's cumulative or you cumulate. So, for example, you have this. Okay, so these are scores of a semi-professional bowling league. Okay, so if you notice, in the class interval, you have arranged the data from the lowest to the highest. That is the usual orientation that we have, arranging data from uh, lowest to highest. So, we have 140 to 164. So, if you notice... Oh, the width of the class interval is 15. But if you subtract 164 minus 140, you will not find 15, but you will only find 14. So how will you do it? How will you find the, the real difference or the real width? If you subtract the uh, lower limit of the next class interval by the lower limit of the previous class interval. So in this case, that's 165 minus 140 and uh, yeah, it's not really, it's not 15, by the way, it's 25, so 65 minus 40 is 25, so the class width is 25, so, and it is all throughout, so if you notice, you are simply adding 25, 25 plus 25, 25, 25, and so on. Then, the same way with the upper uh, limit, you will have, you are adding uh, 20, one, 164 plus 25 plus 25 plus 25 plus 25. So notice they are non overlapping, they are mutually exclusive. So, let me overlap. It's 140 to 164, then the next is 165 to 189, and so on. Then, these are the frequencies. So, how many were uh, has scored 140 to 164? So, there are 93. Those who scored 165 to 189 is 107. So you would say that majority of the players in a semi-professional bowling league scored between 165 to 189 because uh, there are 107 in terms of frequency, followed by 140 to 164, followed by 240 to 264, 215 to 239 and very few were able to score 265 to 289 the class boundaries although i have not mentioned it in the previous slides and the class boundaries is simply you are going to subtract 0 0.5 to because it's a whole number you will subtract 0 0.5 to 140 and add 0 0.5 to the upper limit 164 so that's 139.5 to 164.5. And this time, if you're going to subtract 164.5 minus 139.5, the result is 25. The class boundaries is now called the true limits. Unlike here, although this is the lower limit, upper limit, but you cannot find the width of 25 by simply subtracting upper limit minus lower limit. But for the class boundaries, when you are subtracting 0.5 to the lower limit, adding 0.5 to the upper limit, if you are going to subtract them, you will get the result of 25. That's why it is called the true limits. And x is the midpoint, so you will just add 140 plus 164 divided by 2, so that is 152. And that is enough already, the first point, because the technique is you will not constantly add and divide by 2 all of these class intervals. But since we knew that 25 is the width, you will simply add 25 from 152 to here so you get 177 at 25 at 25 and so on until the last class interval then the relative frequency is he computed based on the frequency of that uh, 
interval. So, you have 93 over 397 relative frequency is 0.23. And you continue doing. So, the total of relative frequency is 1.0 or that is 100%. If you do not want to express them in decimal because you wanted to see it in terms of percent as whole number, so you will convert 20, 0.23 into a uh, whole number. So, that's 23%. Here, that's 27, 12, 14, 20, and 4%. And you will notice you will get a sum of 100%. So sometimes at the lower, at the last class interval, you have to do some adjustment because if there are some, uh, you'd make rounding, uh, round offs here, there is a rounding error here. So uh, it will be over 100 or over 1, 1.00 if you do not adjust the relative frequency of the last class interval. So there has to be some adjustment on the uh, relative frequency on the class interval. So to, to make uh, things easier, you will add all of this and subtract it to 1 so you will get the relative frequency of the last class interval. Then the cumulative frequency. So the cumulative frequency is, notice that on the class interval 140 to 164, you have the cumulative frequency 93. Okay, so... The next is 107. So when you accumulate, you will simply add 93 plus 107. So you have 200 plus 46. So 246 plus 55. That's 301 plus 80. 381 plus 16. 397. Take note that the last entry here is the total number of observations. So if you add all the frequencies, that's 397. And that is also... 397. So just constantly adding, adding, and adding, adding, and so on until you reach the total number of observations. That's for the less than cumulative frequency. But for the greater than cumulative frequency, you have to start the first entry is 397. That is the total number of observations. And then you subtract 97 and 93. So you have 304. Subtract 107. You have 197 as the next entry. Subtract 46. So you have 151. Subtract 80. So you have 96. Subtract 16. Oh, I'm sorry. 96 minus 16. Oh, no. 96 minus 80. Then that is 16. Okay, so when you subtract 96 minus 80, that's 16. And notice that the entries at the last are the same. So that is 16. So that's how we do it in the uh, grouped frequency distribution. Now, understanding the grouped frequency distribution is uh, that's a bit tricky. Because you don't need to summarize them in uh, tables like that. But you have to... Uh, you have to understand what is in there. Okay, so you have, for example, you have here 246 in the less than uh, cumulative frequency, 246, and it is on the interval 190 to 204. So how will you understand 246? So you would say there are 246 players who scored... 214 or lower in a semi-professional bowling league. Again, 246 is in here. So that means to say there are 246 uh, players, bowling players, who scored 214 or less in a semi-professional bowling league. Or if we take uh, 301, we would say 300. there are 301 players who scored 239 or below in a semi-professional bowling league. Okay, so that's how to do it. But for the greater than CF, let's say it's, you have 197, so you would say there are 197 players who scored 190 and above in a semi-professional bowling league. 
Again, you would say there are 197 players who scored 190 and above in a semi-professional uh, bowling league. Now, how do we construct for contribution table? So, the easiest thing to construct for contribution table is uh, to use this formula. Or, this is just for, I mean, this formula is not really the hard and fast rules because you can always construct frequency distribution table by intervals. Uh, you just have to estimate the interval. If you want to have it the interval of 5 or 10, you, you can always do that. But you have to take note that when you use, uh, when you are going to... Uh, say summarize them in a frequency distribution table group frequency distribution table you should it should be a multiple of five or a multiple of ten okay so for example this one you have although this is very few you have 30 basketball players so if you are going to take a look at what is the lowest uh number here in terms of height so 72 so maybe you can have you can start with 70 then you will have an interval of 5 so 70 71 72 73 74 so 70 to 74 that is the first class interval followed by 75 to 79 80 to 80. that's so easy without using any formula. So, take note that, again, it's a multiple of 5 or a multiple of 10. So, I'll just keep this formula because that is going to uh, keep you a little bit uh, confused. Okay, so, you may start this one with 70 to like that. So, it's going to make life easier. But you can re always review this one. Okay, so graphic depiction of data can be uh, in terms of Pareto diagram or a bar graph like this one. Okay, MS Excel is going to help you with the graphing as well as also the, the software SPSS or this one. There's a bar. You can have also that. That one and you can have a pie. So, want to use a pie? Okay, so emphasize your data fits in relation to the larger whole. So that's like that. There's also in the MS Excel, the line graph is to emphasize movement or trend. So, okay, so that's the example. We will have a separate uh, session on how to do it in the MS Excel in case you do not know. But you can always explore uh, in the MS Excel. Then you have the stem and leaf plot. Uh, this is not the common because you will have to take note that in the stem and leaf plot, you have here the stem, so that is the first number in. So when you're going to read this one, it's 90, 90, 91, 89, 88, 84, 83, 78, 75, 72, 65. That's how a stem and leaf uh, plot is. Uh, used or you can have this uh, that lot okay so the minutes to eat breakfast okay so how long does it take one to eat breakfast so in minutes zero so it's what is that is that a breakfast if you eat it in zero minutes so maybe that's just drinking uh, milk you're just drinking milk or drinking coffee but it's more of the cold one because you can drink it in seconds not in minutes but if it is a hot one you cannot drink it all at once so it will take minutes so here there are six people who eat breakfast zero minutes one until 12 minutes so if you're going to denote that in a dot plot you would notice that you can count that there are one, two, three, four. There are six people who ate breakfast in zero minutes and so on. And you would notice in six and seven, there are no one who eats breakfast at this rate of six or seven minutes. Then you have the histogram. Okay, so that's the histogram. You can also do that in the Excel or you, that's the product of the results of the uh, SPSS. 
Then for the scatter plots, so for statistical summary, if you're going to uh, show relationship, the scatter diagram or the scatter plot, that is how you, uh, how it is being done. Okay, so you can do this in Excel, but mostly you can do this in the SPSS. Then the time series graphs. Okay, so if you're an economist, you're familiar with time series, uh, you will have this one. Okay, so most of the graphs that shows time series is either on the SPSS or on the R. Okay, that's an open source. So now we will move on to uh, the next one, which is the measures of central tendency. Okay, so there are com there are three measures of central tendency the mode the median and the mean so when you say the mode that's good for uh nominal data like just uh gender mode so you just have to count how many males and females and those uh, more in the frequency that's the mode most frequent Okay, so if it is in a score, so that's most frequent score, or if it is on survey, the most frequent answer. Or if we're talking about civil status, the most number of uh, civil status. Then median, that's the half. So that divides the cases into 50-50. Uh, Okay, but then the median is insensitive of the extreme values because it's only looking at the center. It's more of the center. There's, they, they don't care about the extremes, the, the lowest and the highest. So, uh, but this is used for interval or ratio as when data is non-normal, then you will present median. So, if it is a normally distributed data, then you will present the mean. Okay, so mean is simply adding then dividing the total uh, number of observations. So this is very sensitive. The mean is very sensitive on the extremes. Okay, so extremes are outliers. So you can compute mean using uh, the MS Excel. So you just have to use the data analysis tool. But we, will all, we will have a uh, lecture for that. Then the mean, median, and the model age, if you're going to have this example, okay, so first thing is you sort the data in order, of course. Sort them. So the lowest is 9, highest is 12. So if you're asked for the uh, mean, you will add all of this and divide by 10. So the mean is 10.9. And if you're going to find for the median, the median is in between 11 and 12. Because even numbered mentions, so it's in between 11 and 12, so you add 11 and 12, that is 11.5. If it is an add number, so there's additional value here, then it might be 12. Okay, the mode, since this is the most frequent score, oh, that is 12. Then we have measures of dispersion. Okay, so in the measures of dispersion, you have to take a look at the range, the standard deviation, and the uh, variance. So range is the difference between the highest and the lowest, sensitive to extreme scores, but it does not speak much of the data in between. Okay, so you can always calculate the interquartile range. So, so that is you, div it, you divide your data set into four. So you have the 25th, the 75th, and of course the, the middle is your mid -band. Okay, so for example, you have these heights, 38 and 77 inches. So you subtract 77 minus 38, so that is 39, somewhere somewhere here that's your range but if you are going to have this one on uh median so what is your median 38 to 77 so 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 so 9 so it is the 1 2 3 4 62 is your uh median so somewhere here is the median 
Okay, so just another example also, but that's so graphic. So then we have the dispersion. So measure estimates of dispersion is variance and standard deviation. You will not do it in the manual way, but you will have to do it in the MS Excel. Okay, so variance is the average of the square distances or square deviations from the mean. Okay, so that's variance. But if we're going to get the square root of that, that is the standard deviation. We will be using standard deviation paired with the mean because uh, the mean and the standard deviation has the same units of measure. And when you are going, if the data is normally distributed, you will present the mean and you will also present the standard deviation. Then you have uh, skewness of the distribution. If it is skewed to the right or skewed to the left, okay, so that's, this is how the skewness look like. This is positively skewed because... Uh, that is having a longer right tail and this is negatively skewed having a, a longer left tail okay so data is skewed if it is not normally distributed so a normally distributed data is the one that is bell shaped but uh, skewed data that is looking like this one longer left or longer right not bell shaped so how do we understand skewness in the language of finance so in finance the concept of skewness is utilized in the analysis of the distribution of the returns on investment the roi so although many financiers and models assume that the returns of securities follow a normal distribution but in reality it is skewed so when we say negatively skewed, the negative skewness of the distribution indicates that an investor may expect frequent small gains and a few large losses. So in reality, when you do trading, uh, this is the one that is employed by traders based on negatively skewed distributions. Okay, so... Again, it is based on negatively uh, skewed distribution because you would be expecting that if it is negatively skewed, you would be expecting small gains, frequent small gains, but very few large losses. So despite the fact that strategies based on negative skewness uh, may provide stable profits, an investor or a trader should be aware also that there is a probability of large losses as the one I mentioned. So thus, it is also imperative to properly assess the risk of the trading strategies. When are you going to sell your stocks? When are you going to buy stocks? That is based on uh, skewness. Cortosis is also a, a measure of the shape of the distribution. Okay, so it's normal if it is equal to 3, platyquartic if it is less than 3, and liptoquartic if it is greater than 3. So that's how it looks like. And there is a term excess cortosis. So an excess cortosis is a metric that compares the cortosis of the distribution against the cortosis of a normal distribution. Okay, so excess cortosis is the given cortosis minus the 3, which is the normal distribution. So that is excess. Of course, that we know how to do it, excess. Okay, so mesocortic data follows a distribution when the excess cortosis of 0 or close to 0. So that means if the data follows a normal distribution, then it is also following a mesocortic distribution. While an elliptocortic uh, distribution, it indicates a positive excess cortosis, so it shows heavy tails on either side, indicating there are large outliers. In finance, elliptocortic distribution shows that the investment returns may be uh, prone to extreme values on either side. So therefore, uh, who's when, a, when an investment return has, following a elliptocortic distribution then that is considered to be risky. If it is the returns is following a liptocortic distribution, then that is risky. 
Okay, so it is prone to extreme values on either side. Then we have this measures of position relevance. So to be able to evaluate our relative position when interested in comparing performance and knowing the ranking. So that's uh, position. So we have quartiles, percentiles, decimals. Percentiles is the one used for the board exam. Quartiles, so that's so easy. So you divide it into four quarters, four equal parts, Q1, Q2, Q3. So those are the uh, divisions, 25th percentile, 50th percentile, 75th percentile. Q2 is also the median. Okay, so yeah, that's what I told you. So if we are going to take a look at that. So this is the Q sub 1, the median, and the Q sub 3. So for example, you will find here, find Q1, median, and Q3. So you divide, you arrange, of course, arrange the data in order. Median is 15. That's the middle most. Okay, so there are four observations in the right, four observations in the left. So 15 is the median. So that means to say... Uh, there are scores higher, 50% of the scores are higher than 15, and 50% of the scores are lower than 15. Then Q1, you have there, uh, you divide this into 2, so that is the division here is in between 9 and 12. So 9 plus 12, that is 10.5, that is your Q sub 1. Then here, for Q sub 3 is between 19 and 20. So that is 19.5, that is your Q sub 3. Percentiles. Okay, so that's the values of the variable that divide a rank set into 100 subsets. You can also find percentiles using the Excel. So everything should not be made difficult doing the manual laborious computation, but we will do it in the Excel. So for example, you have P30, that is 38%. Okay, so we have to take note that Q1 is 25th percentile, that's the one I told you a while ago. Q2, 50th percentile, Q3, 75th percentile. Then you have this percentile example, okay, so 78%. If your percentile is 78, that means 78%. Of those who took the exam has smaller scores than you are. That's how we understand in the board exam. So it's not your score. So if your board exam rating is 80, that means to say you bested 80% of those who took the exam. That's not, uh, it's not the way that you made uh, correctly 80%. So no. So when you say is your does making the 80th percentile mean that you made 80% on the test? No, that means that you bested or you did better than the 80% of those who took the same exam. That's how it is understood. Or if your rating is 90 in the board exam, then that means to say that you perform better than the 90% of those who took the exam. So when you took board exam, it is very important that you have to take note who are your competitors. So if you were taking an exam and you were with uh, an intelligent group, chances are they are going to fail you because their scores are higher, their low scores are higher. So when you are going to... Uh, Take the percentile rank of your score, then you might be on the uh, failing end. Okay, so that's how we uh, compute uh, position locator. We will not do that here, computation.